area of chemical ecology, chemical communication amongst insects and amongst insects and, and plants, uh, uh, just how chemicals uh, have uh, influenced uh, pests and uh, behavior. And my focus right now, my current research is um, invasive species. In my career of 35 years here on the Big Island, we've worked on post-harvest quarantine treatments, which is methods for shipping uh, produce from uh, the, the islands to other places, uh, working on, uh, let's say, avocado, post-harvest treatment of avocados. <clears throat> we, we work with papayas and many tropical fruits. And, uh, but my current, my current job, in, in addition to uh, managing a, a, a group of scientists, which is like herding cats, <laughs> is um, uh, dealing with some of the administrative stuff and also um, you know, trying to make sure that the people that come after me are, are as excited about the research as I was during, or I am during my career. But I too am looking for retirement, so maybe uh, I'll be joining you guys for the uh, Monday talks here in a year or so. Okay? So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, chemical ecology perspective and invasive species pest management. And there, there's so many things to talk about here on the Big Island that I'm going to try and limit my talk to some things which I think would be interesting to the, to the audience, which is technology driven. So, you know, there's a lot of standard stuff about how to spray pesticides, how to do this and how to do that. It's not my focus of this talk to, to give you that, that specific knowledge. A lot of knowledge about how to control your household pests and things could be uh, obtained through the uh, uh, University of Hawaii Cooperative Extension Service, which is our vehicle to get information from the research laboratories out to the users. And some of you who are, who are established, who are retired, and, and who have a lot of knowledge of government programs, university programs, understand that as a research entity, our job is primarily research, but that we still need to get technology transfer to the farmers, to the homeowners, etc. We do that in conjunction with the Cooperative Extension Service. There is time when we need to uh, deal directly with the farmers, but it takes away from, from, from the research, some of which can be plain out boring, some could be fascinating. So I hope that you'll come away with a little bit of uh, knowledge of both, and maybe with some feedback you'll uh, have a little bit of, of information about our laboratory in, in Hilo. So today I'm going to cover uh, a number of top topics. The first, a little bit about our laboratory in Hilo, the U.S. Pacific Basin Agricultural Research Center. I'm going to jump right into fruit flies as invasive species, talk a little bit about this uh, stinging nettle moth, which came in about seven or eight years ago to the Big Island and caused some problems, but has, we think it's now under control. This problem with little fire ant, which is not only becoming a problem uh, in orchards, but even in coffee fields. You know, you have, you have coffee which is hand harvested, and this little fire ant is now being found in some of the coffee fields. Well, very soon, you're going to find a lot of the workers are not going to want to pick your coffee if this little fire ant is not under control. I'm going to talk about some kind of cool stuff that Matthew started back there with me on RFID tags putting on fruit flies and trying to track where they go. And it's a, it's a thing that, that uh, it's uh, not ready for prime time, but I thought if I talked to you guys about it, maybe somebody would say, we do that with oceanography and we can, uh, you know, uh, we can put a tag on a polyp that, that is released from a, from a sea urchin or something. So maybe, maybe we, we have somebody who can help us improve that RFID tag thing. And then we're going to talk about an invasive species that is not here yet, but has been all through the Pacific. And this is the coconut rhinoceros beetle, something that we hope doesn't come here, but that uh, Fernando in the back there has, has in Palau, and he can tell you it devastated the coconut and palm industry for many years in Palau before it became under control. I hope you get through this in about 30 minutes because uh, we have to leave at about 6.30 to get back to Hilo for a flight. Uh, at, uh, somebody has to go to the airport and, and Yang has to take somebody to the airport. So I apologize if I'm going to run through these uh, uh, slides quickly. But feel free to interrupt if you don't understand something. I'll leave you my cards. And uh, what I would like to leave you guys with is, is at some point, I hope that you and Rod and the, the gang would consider maybe coming over to Hilo and having one of these... Tech Talk Mondays over in Hilo. I'll open up the lab and we'll go look at all the, the things we're doing in the lab. And, you know, before I retire, I, I have access to a lab and I can open it up for groups like this. But after I retire, I'm like the rest of you guys. I, I have to give up my badge and my keys and maybe I'm going to join you guys. Okay? So I'm going to go through this uh, rather rapidly and, and I hope you guys can uh, understand this. This is a little bit about our, our lab called the U.S. Pacific Basin Agricultural Research Center. It's part of the USDA 
Agricultural Research Service. So ARS is the research en entity of USDA, and its primary responsibility is to conduct research that would improve agriculture, protect agriculture, and help develop sustainable, cost-effective, environmentally compatible methods for uh, pest disease control and also production and also uh, improving um, uh, agriculture generally uh, within the United States and the Pacific Rim. So part of our job is here in Hawaii, part of our job is in the Pacific Rim, and part of it is sort of like making sure that California, Florida, Texas, all these big agricultural states don't get these fruit flies and other invasive pests. So this lab was, the, the idea of the lab was created in 1999, and it was made up with, of a number of laboratories that had existed in Hawaii for many, many years. The lab that I was associated with called the Hawaiian Fruit Fly Lab, or the Tropical Fruit and Vegetable Lab, has been in Hawaii for over 100 years as a USDA entity. But we were small, you know, it wasn't, it, we didn't have a platform to talk about all these issues, and the Senator Inouye, before he passed away, had a vision that he wanted to create uh, a center, and he, he wanted it here on the Big Island of all places. And there was a lot of discussion. Shouldn't it be in, on Oahu, where the university is? Shouldn't it be someplace else? Uh, he decided that he wanted it in, in, um, in uh, Hilo, and we said, yes, sir. We'll be glad <laughs> to put it in Hilo. He donated uh, $25 million through you know, his politicking. We got half the lab built, which is sort of what you see here. But we ran out of money before he passed away. Unfortunately, we only have half of it built, and we have a vision for completing it, but we don't know when it's going to be completed. We actually occupied the facility in 2006. It's made up of uh, laboratory space. I don't know how many square feet, but it's quite big. It's got uh, uh, offices and for technicians and, and about 20 uh, PhD level scientists and postdocs uh, and uh, a staff of, of about 60 people. We have a total group in this lab of about 80 people, all federal government employees. So we were on furlough a couple weeks ago and now we're back working. But uh, thanks to your tax dollars, I think we've, uh, we've managed to uh, uh, do a pretty good job of the things we do. We cover everything from pests and diseases to horticultural issues looking at new varieties of lychee that flower on time, controlling flowering of lychee. Uh, we're, we're looking at flowering of coffee right now as a way to control the coffee berry borer. By controlling flowering of this insect, we might have a better way so that the, the, you can determine when is it that you want your, your coffee to be set, and you can control that a little bit better than just the way we're picking it historically, which is first in, first out. So we're looking at a lot of innovative things, and I don't, won't have time to talk too much about that today as I'm going to concentrate on my pet peeves. Our facilities are, are rather uh, unique, but also <clears throat> quite sophisticated and new. It covers everything from molecular biology, genomics, and computational biology, uh, using computers and things, to insect and plant physiology, biochemistry, plant physiology, insect biology, behavior, and ecology. Uh, we have an insectary where we raise insects. and uh, We have a big germplasm repository where we grow many types of crops. Uh, and we have, of course, the, the shade houses, field cages, field sites where we do a lot of our research. Some of the research, when we translate it down to the, uh, to the level of the farmer, sometimes we'll ask some of you folks, can we do an experiment in your, uh, in your property? We have a new, let, let's say we have a new uh, lure for coffee berry boy, which is better than methanol ethanol. We might say, hey, would you mind if we come down and do some of these studies to see, can we compare our new lure versus the, the standard and see if it's any better and use your farm as a testing ground? We have well-equipped functional laboratories. Again, we have an open lab concept, so instead of individual labs, we have one big lab. And they're, they're, they're separated by uh, bench tops, and, and uh, we have cold rooms, we have uh, analytical equipment of different types, uh, a lot of functional space here, but we're also very crowded as, with 80 people walking around there all the time. We have a staff of about 16 PhD scientists. We have some postdocs, which rise, raise that number to about 20 PhD level people. Uh, they range from entomologists, plant pathologists, biologists, food technologists, and I forgot to mention Yang, who's a chemist. We have uh, 50, 50 to 60 permanent and temporary technical staff and students that are all together trying to uh, work to improve agriculture in the state. We're going to talk a little bit about fruit flies. Since uh, 1895, we've managed to get uh, four species of economically important fruit flies here in Hawaii. If you think back, if there wasn't fruit flies, we could have had a lot different agricultural perspective than what we ended up with, which was sugarcane, which was not a fruit fly host, pineapple, which was not a fruit fly host, and the lack of diversity. We're, make, we're trying to make up for that now because we've lost sugar. We've 
almost lost pineapple. And people are looking for diversified agriculture. Well, how, we, how do we do it? Well, one of the ways we do it are these guys, trying to figure out how to control these guys. Because uh, these four in total could probably attack 90% 90, 90 of what you grow here. Anything you can grow from strawberries to blueberries to papaya to apples, <coughs> these guys can take care of them. And the first one that came into Hawaii, which was the melon fly in 1895, set the stage. It was devastating. You could barely grow vegetables in, on the islands until a little bit later. That was followed by the infamous Mediterranean fruit fly in 1912. The Oriental fruit fly, which came right after the war from uh, uh, Micronesia, Saipan, Guam, uh, it, you know, all that war effort. There was machinery and, and troop movement and everything else you can imagine. Well, this guy hitchhiked through here and got established here, unfortunately, and it hasn't left us yet. And of course, the Solanaceous fruit fly, or back to shore, came in 1985. And we don't know for example, for sure whether it could have been here earlier, but that was the, the four species. So this is this is net fly, this is uh, um, uh, I think oriental fruit fly, this is melon fly, this is latifarm. Are any of those also Drosophila megalo megalocaster? No, that's a different one. The Drosophila melanogaster is almost a protected species here. Yeah. And it's protected because of evolution. And the Hawaiian Islands are one of the best places in the world to study Drosophila. And Drosophila has evolved in very unique ways here. And we, we ourselves, I don't think we'd be allowed to, to try to control the Drosophila, uh, but we would need to work on ways which we find would be Drosophila specific. So we have a Drosophila here called uh, Drosophila suzukii, which attacks fresh fruits. The majority of the Drosophila attacks things that are in the decaying mode. So if you have a compost pile, if you have banana peels, that's the Drosophila that you see. They can appear one day and have another cohort the next day. These save a little bit more time, but, but they're, they attack the fresh fruits. So if you see worms in your papaya, or if you see them in your mangoes, it's these fruit flies, okay? So why are fruit flies a serious problem in Hawaii? Well, obviously, because as new tourists, they check, check in, but they don't check out. And in, in 1989, this was you know 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, it was 300 million. It's probably a billion dollars of lost revenue, uh, extra cost for pesticide usage, uh, and of course, with those come in the environmental effects of pesticide uses. So undoubtedly, it's much higher today. And it came from this book, which if you go to the, the, the store, you can still see this book from time to time. But it hasn't been updated, but it's a huge cost. And the reason why they sent some of us to Hawaii is some of us had to come here to live in Hawaii. Oh. So for 35 years, I bit the bullet and said, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, fall on the sword and live in Hawaii for 30 years. So it, but it's been great here. Uh, fruit flies, of course, limit export market opportunities. They, they require us to uh, engage in costly quarantine treatments, things like irradiation, hot water treatments, these kinds of things. And these things are expensive, and they cause some damage to the fruit from time to time. Uh, but it's the only way that we're allowed to ship things. Otherwise, the inspectors at the airport, who are the inspectors of shipments for export, won't allow these fruits and vegetables. We can grow anything in the world here. The problem is, you know, can we grow it economically? safely so that everybody in the state is on board with the majority of techniques that we use. Can we do it in an environmentally and sustainable way? And I want to point out sustainability because those of us who've been here for a while and who've decided to make this home do want an island which is going to be sustainable in its own right. And we definitely want things that are sustainable here. So, uh, you know, we can have debates about sustainability, but sustainability is about doing things that are Pono in the right way that we can make sure that everybody can live with it. You don't have to uh, always agree with it, but can you live with it? Okay. Some of the things that we developed, which again, now I'm going to talk about things which, which some of you guys might be interested in, is technology. One of the things we developed many years ago is a very unique concept called the sterile insect technique. And I don't know if anybody's uh, of you have heard about that, but the sterile insect technique is a, is a unique uh, uh, way of uh, exercising birth control of invasive pests. And what we do with the sterile insect technique, uh, we developed in the 60s in Hawaii here a way to artificially rear large numbers of fruit flies. Okay, these are mass reared uh, in, in colonies, millions of them. And then what we would do is we'd artificially sterilize them. At the time we use irradiation. Okay, now we're looking at possibly other ways, genetic modifications, other ways to make them genetically sterile. We then release these flies 
into the environment where uh, a gravid female fly who is not sterile, she would, if she looks around and we have enough of these sterile males, she's going to eventually mate with one of the sterile males, assuming now that there's no difference between the, the sterile male and the wild male. So we have to make sure that that is done correctly. So this method called the sterile, uh, sterile insect technique has revolutionized some of the work that has been done on fruit fly. It is used around the world in controlling fruit flies. And it started here in Hawaii. They've made some further improvements. We have uh, all male strains where we, where we can only release the male of the species, which is very unique because uh, right now, if we didn't have that, we would be raising male and female together and double our cost of rearing. So we have an expensive diet and so forth. And so we're looking always for ways to, to improve this, this technology. But the technology that we developed uh, may be a little dated now, but it involved what at the time was very unique kind of things that uh, nobody else had ever thought about. They, they had done a little bit of work with this on screwworm within the United States. And screwworm was eradicated from all the southern states using the sterile insect technique. So about the same time that we developed this technique for fruit flies. So why is it fruit fly sterile insect technique used in Hawaii? Good question. Well, the main question is the cost of the technology is still high. So as we reduce the cost and as we continue to get support from legislators, le legislators and others to possibly buy into the technology and work uh, with other technologies to bring together uh, a, a program that would work, we might get buy-in from, from, from others about that. Another thing that we've done, which again is kind of low-tech, but involves very sustainable methodologies, is the introduction of, of parasitoids, reconnaissance parasitoids. And these parasitoids actually uh, attack the eggs and the larvae of our fruit flies, lay their eggs in those insects, and instead of a fruit fly coming out, one of these parasite, parasites coming out. Okay, So one would say, uh-oh, another bi biological control program, similar to, uh, let's say, um, uh, mongoose and all these horror stories that you hear about. Well, over many, many years, we've, we've done uh, a tremendous amount of work looking at the specificity of this insect. And we have not been able to find anything but the, the tephritid fruit flies, not even Drosophila, only the tephritid fruit flies that it will attack. Some of them will only attack certain species, which is, which is a problem. But the, the usefulness of biological control is that it's self-sustaining. Once, once they get into the system, they'll keep a low-level control. They won't eradicate, but they'll keep a low-level suppression on your farm, which allows you to employ other techniques, which on top of that would allow you to uh, benefit and, and really control the fruit flies much better. In, in, in 2000, we started a, an area-wide fruit fly program, and that program has been uh, based in, on, in the state. It's been very successful. We teach farmers and homeowners how to properly suppress fruit fly populations, and we've transferred that technology to the Cooperative Extension Service now. But it, it was an award-winning program and very, very useful. Would any of that work on that Willy Willy once? Um, we're not well working on the Willy Willy wasp, but the state of Hawaii has another biological control agent that they just released about a year ago. It's not doesn't look exactly like this, but it does the same thing. And in the places where the Willy Willy has died back, it's starting to grow back now. Mm -hmm. So the same technology here, but it took four years of testing because uh, this this in, this uh, uh, biological control agent was was um, introduced just four years ago. So the standards have gone way up. Nobody wants a biological control agent here that's going to attack something unwanted. So the state of Hawaii had to, we've probably done four times as much testing as we have in the past, just because of public concern. So that's very important for us to, to, to make sure that, that we do the best possible uh, work that we can do to make sure that we're not causing more damage to the environment. So very important. Is, is that the similar approach they're making with the guava? Yes, very similar. Again, uh, the U.S. Forest Service has taken part of that. It doesn't kill the guava because there are people who make jams and other things. But what it does is, is it reduces the, the, the population of guava so that that invasive guava, if you cultivate it, it should be OK. But, but in these forested areas and things where it's sustainable, where it's, where it's going wild, this is where this biological control agent would work very well. Okay. We, we work very hard in forming a, different types of alliances. And I won't get into this so much because we work closely with the University of Hawaii and other stakeholders and managers. But, it's, it's a process that, that has evolved so that we can better understand 
exactly what the consumers, the stakeholders really want from us as a government agency. Okay, I'm gonna, I've got a half an hour left to, to, to talk before I leave about four other projects. I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly. One is uh, the development of a, a sex pheromone for controlling the nettle moth, Darna oliva. And, and a sex pheromone is, is an odor. In the, in the area that I work in, which is the area of chemical ecology, it's how odors and, and volatile chemicals affect insect behavior. A pheromone is something that's produced by one, in, one of, uh, of the species, like a male or a female, that attracts the opposite sex. So that's what a pheromone is. So we're using this technology uh, to our benefit to try and uh, look for more user-friendly techniques to bring the insects to us instead of you just broadcast spraying pesticides to try and find them. A background. Uh, this was discovered on the Big Island in 2001. We think it's introduced in Taiwan. Has a large host range, main, mainly in uh, nursery stock, but you can find it in grasses too. If many of you have acreage and you walk through there in your shorts and slippers and you get stung, it may not be just an irritation or a fire ant, maybe these stinging nano caterpillars. And they have spines and they're very hazardous to, can be to the public. This is what the, what the larvae of the stinging caterpillar looks like. And you don't see them unless you look for them, but they can cause sort of severe necrosis of, of, the, of the stings along the legs wow. and the hands. Mm. And uh, they're not fun if you get stung by one of them. It's not lethal, but it can cause severe allergenic reactions. Are those the same ones that eat up the leaves of passion fruit? Uh, I'm not sure if these do it. They might be able to, do you know? I think they're, they're mostly as grasses. Yeah, the main. but we find them on nursery stock also. But you can see this is a close-up of the guy. So you wouldn't want to be passing through a, a field with these guys in it. And so what we were asked to do, we got a Hawaii Invasive Species Grant to look at uh, chemical control methods to control these things. And we started, obviously, because Matthew and I are chemical ecologists, we wanted to look at, do these things have pheromones, and how can we use it to, to help control the insect, or at least better detect them? Because we had no... no uh, information about this insect, other than it might be from Taiwan. We asked the Taiwanese, they said they don't have a pheromone, so we're off to the races looking for the secret lure that could possibly trap them. Okay, so a little bit about sex pheromones, they're species specific. In this case, they're produced by females, and the males have very specialized antennae that they use to detect the female odor, okay? So it, it, it's kind of cool that, that insects have evolved a specialized mechanism for finding mates, can we turn it around and use it to our benefit? So a lot of things we do involve behavior, and so we have to not only identify pheromones, we have to see if the behavior is right when we identify them. You know, we could be uh, choosing the wrong molecule, and if we choose the wrong molecule, then it's not going to work. So we use wind tunnel, we, we've gone to outdoor field cages, we've done a lot of different ways to test these things. And you know, this is the fun part of the research, where you get to play with, with uh, different things. This is a 30-year-old wind tunnel, so I don't have the high-tech version of it yet. I think my predecessor, whoever replaces me, will probably come up with a computerized high-tech version of that. Uh, another high-tech thing we use is a process called uh, gas chromatograph electroantennagram detection. And this will take a second to explain, but you guys might get a kick out of these. We, uh, we use a technique which has been developed for a few years, but we use it quite a bit in our lab where we look at the, and the insect antennae as a sensor, okay? So it's another way of, of using the insect to tell us what kind of molecules it's responding to. And so we have a gas, a gas chromatograph, which some of you might know of as an instrument that separates compounds into their component parts. Uh, in this uh, picture here, the gas chromatograph will split 50% of its odor out to a detector, which in this case is a fl flame ionization detector, and 50% of it goes out a special tube onto an, an insect perforation. In this case, this is the antennae right here of the um, nanocaterpillar, the male nanocaterpillar. So as the odors come through and they're separated out into the component peaks, if the, if the insect smells that odor, it'll give us a signal. So a little bit of tap. I had to give something like that. Yeah. So, How long has that antenna been dead? It's not dead. You cut off the head, it'll last for, for uh, hours. Yeah, we can use the whole moth, but movement and things, you have, you have mechanoreceptors and other receptors, so by lopping off the head, we find that it's, uh, that it's more stable for a while. Okay? The moth's running around, the head's gone. Yeah, so, so this is kind of an, uh, a schematic of, of how we determine things. This is the 
FID, the flame ionization detector, as determined by the machine. And these little peaks that come out are potential compounds, which chemists like Matthew and Yang uh, go back and identify through a complex process, which I won't get into. But on the other side of the, of the coin are the antennal responses. And as you can see, there's some, there's some responses here, there's some responses here. Some responses don't line up with anything we can see, but some line up with some pretty nice peaks of chemicals that, that once we identify these, we can say, this could be a, a, a pheromone component, or it could be that this one and this one together in a 95 ratio or 95-5 ratio could be the, the pheromone. So we have to work through all these things, and it takes some effort, but it's kind of a mystery and detective story, and we, we enjoy doing that. Wouldn't they detect things other than pheromones, smell all sorts of things? All kinds of things. And, and, and so we, uh, Matthew and Yang, they have to say, what is this? Is it, is it, is it pheromone, or is it just uh, ethyl acetate, or is it, is it some other things? And again, as I'll get to later, even though you, you get the antennae to respond, the antennae does not tell you whether, whether the odor is attractive or repellent, okay? So if, you, if, you, if I blindfolded you and, and, and put your wife's perfume in my body odor, you'll get a good response on your brain signals if we hooked you up. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't know without your behavior. <laughs> Where, you know, so, but if you could move and you're just there in a, in a cage, that's what, this, that's the limitations of this, okay? So. How does the insect determine which direction the odor comes from? If, if they're submerged in a cloud, yes, they must respond to a gradient. Yes, they they not only do they respond to a gradient, but they, they cast, they cast, and they go in and out of plumes. The rate at which they encounter these odor molecules as packets determine how close they are to the to the to the to the trap. As they get closer and closer, it's sort of like a Geiger counter. Tick 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 tick. tick, tick. That's how they find it, and it's pretty cool how they do that. And, and the, the physical way that they do that is, is, is a physiochemical method with receptor proteins and, and binding proteins. It gets very biochemical at some point. So, uh, but we use this just as a tool to see what's out there and how, what, what they respond to. This is more Matthew and Yang's area, but this is how we do structural identification. So it's complex. I can't tell you how exactly how it's done, but these chemists are, are specialists. And just like you know, uh, everybody has their specials. You guys can, can pull rabbits out of, their, out of their hat. And they can identify things and say, Eric, I think we have ethyl E979 didefinoid. And how they do that, I don't know. But this is one of the components of, of the pheromone. Uh, so, so it's great to have chemists on your team. And as I've learned over the years as an entomologist, you just can't do it by yourself anymore. Uh, here's the synthetic steam. They, they can not only identify it, they can actually make it from scratch, like your mother's famous chocolate chip cookies. And they do that too. So these guys made this stuff and allowed us to take several drops of this, put it in a trap and see what comes out. They did complicated identifications. And what came out was some field testing. Well, lo and behold, when we put a little bit of this stuff on a piece of rubber septa, look what we found. How cool is that? <laughs> And, and, so, and so when you get that, oh my God, it's like one of the aha moments, right? And, and so, so we were jumping up and down that night when we first found this. And okay, now we have the pheromone. Well, we think you have the pheromone. So what? Can you use it for mass trapping? Can you use it for detection? What can you use this for? So we started investigating all the different things we can use it for. The first we looked at is mass trapping. Can we, can we just put it in a trap and collect moths and collect the heck out of it so that there's no more of these moths? Uh, to, to have offspring that would stink. And we forgot quite a few of them. I mean, you know, it works pretty well. But in nature, there's 10 times more than you'll ever catch in a trap for most, for most pests. Uh, so it helps, but it's not by itself the answer. But it, it, it's very important to, to understand how tools like this can be used for things like control, mass trapping. We also looked at where it is on the island, population radiation, because we didn't know where it was before. It started off in Hilo. We started looking... Where could it be? Where the what? If you look at temperature, rainfall, precipitation, where do you find these things? And we did transect lines through different parts of the island just to try and get an idea of where they were. Uh, we looked at the same thing on Oahu and, and created a grid to try and find out where this uh, caterpillar was. And we were able to detect the, the limitations in Mililani and, and uh, 
uh, over on the, the east shore, north shore over here, uh, but we, we only found limited spots over here. So we knew that if we could help to control it over here, it wouldn't become such a big problem in the urban uh, uh, Oahu area. Um, we also looked at the technique which uh, may be a little bit strange to the novice, but it's called mating disruption. And in this technique, we use the pheromone to put so much out there, it's like a cloud, and there's so much out there that the male, when it senses it, will, will not be able to locate the female. They'll, they'll go and, and, and try to mate with the rubber septa rather than find their real mates. And it, this, this technique, believe it or not, is used very successfully in, in Washington State for coddling moss control on apples. And they use this very effectively. They put out thousands of these things on every tree. And the population drops because the real moths can't find the female moths that are mixed amongst all those moths. So it's a gigantic plume, basically. And it works without pesticide sprayings, per se. You can remove these things after the season's over. And it's a, it's a fairly ubiquitous way of, of controlling the moth. Are these chemicals toxic? For the most part, it's the volatile components. So they're not necessarily on all the fruits. And we remove these in time to make sure that there's no residue on the apples or other things. So we were looking at this not for apples, but of course, this was a, a public health pest that we think we wanted to control. So that's been a uh, very, very interesting technology to, to see if we can use this technique. And we think we can. Mm -hmm. About this time, the state started looking at another biological control agent, one that came from Taiwan, which controlled it like a parasite. And that actually ended up being more successful than mating disruption. So in the end, the technology didn't see prime time the way we would hope it would. But it was a good study. Uh, you know, I think it was well worth the effort we put into it. And I think it was kind of neat what we did. You, you say it came from Taiwan. Is Taiwan at a, like a stable population? Yeah, because they have the parasite. Okay. So they have it, but it's not causing them a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is sort of the data. This is one of my few data slides showing the, uh, the uh, uh, difference between the treatment and the control. In the control field, you can see how many moths per field per day. And when we use mating disruption, the population dropped really low, these, these light bars. So we, we could demonstrate that we can control it. But the biological control, we don't have to put these sectors out. They're there all the time. And they may, they may not give us this low, low level, but then is, if it's not life and death, maybe we can live with getting an occasional stamp. Uh, this, is, this is the standard mating disruption that, that we have. Again, the data is very clear, the difference between the control and the treatment. And the last thing we did which is a crazy idea, and I only show one slide of this. We got even crazier one time. We decided we wanted to actually put the pheromone of this moth onto sterile fruit flies, okay? And then we released the fruit flies. Why did we do that? We wanted to find out if the flies, which are flying all over the place, if the moth would, would follow the flies, even causing further confusion. The beauty of this is that the flies would fly into areas that we can't go to hang the, the rubber septum. Okay, so we call this mobile mating dis disruption. We showed the proof of concept. We think it's, it's viable, maybe not as viable as putting spirals out all over the place or, or these septa, but you know, if you can control the, the, the flies at the same time, because they're sterile flies, so they'll still do their thing, and if the male flies and the female flies don't recognize the moth odor, then it could work both ways. So you have sterile flies, which are controlling the fruit fly, and you're, it's disrupting the, the nettle moth at the same time. Are you coating the fly or inserting a gene into the fly? We're, we're feeding the flies right now. Later on, we, we were thinking about everything from spraying them to, to genetic engineering. We're low tech right now. We just, the concept of doing this has never been done before, to my, our knowledge, mm -hmm. to try and put an, a, a chemical on a different species and having the species that it's attracted to fly around. Maybe you could put it into the thing that the caterpillar eats. You could do that. That's a possibility too. So anyway, that's you know we, we I have to be careful. I'm a public servant. Your tax dollars are paying my salary, so I have to make sure that I'm relevant a little bit. So okay, moving on to the next one, little fire ant. This is a, this one which some of you may have or you know about. This is not the the uh, big redheaded imported fire ant which we don't have here, but it causes problems too. Uh, fire ant uh, uh, causes painful stings. It uh, has an immediate and, and a 12-hour effect. Uh, I talked about the fact that it's now being found in coffee. So you can imagine these people 
getting stung by a little fine, they're not going to like it. They're going to say, you want me to pick coffee? Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to double my rate of, of uh, what, what, what you need to pay me. There goes the, the industry. So we need to control coffee variable, which I'm not going to talk about today, but we are doing some research on that. But we also need to control this little fire ant because they go together. These fire ants are found in homes, but they're also found in agricultural communities. And as we depend on laborers and others to pick our fruits and, and do the, this kind of work, we have to ensure their safety. So part of it is ensuring their safety from chemicals, but tests like little fire ant is, is a problem too. So it causes painful stings. It's found fairly innocuously throughout a lot of the world. And when it came to Hawaii, you know, nobody was happy about that. Any of the fire ants are, are pests. So between fire ants and stinging nettle caterpillar, the uh, only thing else we need is snakes. So, um, I can show a photo of a fire ant to see what it looks like. Yeah. Um, uh, well, well, I don't know if I have a picture, but um, maybe one. Maybe one, yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe not, though, Matt. But anyway, Matt and his crew did a wonderful job identifying, identifying components of the pheromone. This is the alarm pheromone. Um, uh, ants have many, many pheromones. They just don't have one. They, have, they, they don't have just the sex pheromone. They have a pheromone which they leave behind when they find food, and it signals other ants. This is the trail to go on. So there's all kinds. This is a social insect, which makes it much more, more complex than just a normal pest. Social insects have queens. They're like honeybees. And these make it much more difficult. Well, it's a complex of, of chemicals, and Matthew and his, his team worked very hard in identifying some of these things. Uh, we developed a, a, a trap which we think might be unique in the sense that this trap can serve as a way to capture the, the ant. But when the ant gets in there, it sends a signal, an odor out there that says, you know, come come over here because this is where I, I found something. But it can't get out. So so it actually self-perpetuates itself. And so that's why we have we call it the one-way trap. And basically the way this works is we put a, a rubber sensor which can, contains the pheromone, a piece of weed mat, and the insects go through this weed mat, but they can't go back the other way. And that's, so they produce these odors and, and the other ants come. The other ants go through the same thing. They go through here, but they can't get away. In the meanwhile, this odor continues to get uh, higher and higher. So it works out very well. Yes? The fire ants are, are to you probably gray, black. They're not red, are they? They're red. They're reddish? Yeah, they're, they're, it's a very small red ant, um, about a millimeter long. Orange. Yeah. Yeah. They live in the trees. And they don't live in the ground like normal fire ants, like you find in. And, and what happens is that if you shake the tree and you're working in the yard, they'll, right, they'll rain right down on you. It's a big pest in some areas of, uh, uh, of the Big Island, especially the Gila side. So anyway, well, here, this is not the real picture of the ant, but this is an idea of how these ants go in there and they don't get out. So that's why Matthew called it the one-way trap. And these, a lot of these studies are published in scientific journals and peer-reviewed and all these kinds of things, which probably not of interest to most of you, but you know, if you need more inf information for those of you who need something to go to sleep with, <laughs> we can send you those PDF files. <laughs> Have a, a nice week before you go to sleep. Uh, Matthew and everybody did a, a number of, of tests using the standard, which is peanut butter uh, versus the one-way trap and double-sided stick, sticky tape. And as you can see, they, they have uh, different responses, but both the sticky tape and the one-way trap work real well. We like the one-way trap. Because sticky tape gets, once, once the, the, the uh, ants are stuck on there, there's only so many that will get on sticky tape. So uh, peanut butter is, is, is historically the way they've done, they've done it in the past. Mind if I ask how, on that one-way weed thing? Yes. Was it just mechanical? Is it some kind of... The, the, the weed mat, Matt, maybe you can explain it, but the weed mat is cone-shaped. Mm -hmm. so, so it's like a cone. So, okay. so for some reason, they can go up into it. But they can't get back. And I think for weeds, they put it down the opposite way because they're, they're trying to prevent the tendrils of the weeds coming up. So it's not it's not oh, just it's a hole. Commercial weed mat. Yeah, okay. commercial weed mat. Okay. Okay. So these traps uh, lasted much longer than expected. They they, uh, um, uh, they they seem to work okay, but the technology is still not ready for for prime time. But we're working along these these lines, and and so these are. It's the concept that I want you guys to, to, to understand a little bit. It's the idea that, that the trap is self-perpetuating. We don't have to rebate it all the time. 
And then when you pick it up, you throw it away, put another trap down. It's filled with ants. You kill the ants and you're done. So it's like a cockroach trap that you use a stick on, sort of like that. Except the in the cockroach trap, they don't call and signal their, their, their other friends to come in. But with the fire ant, they do. So a little bit of conclusion. It, uh, they're highly species specific. We find it that they're very effective. Um, and they, they can last about 40 days. And the ants in the trap are attractive. That's the take-home message. Okay. Okay. This I'll talk about briefly. It's it's the RFID tagging of fruit flies. Okay. So you might get a kick out of this because we're just starting this, but you might be interested in knowing what we're doing here. So why do we try to put RFID tags? These little tags that, that you might see in in clothing, handbags, to, to you know, just to make sure that it's not stolen. Why do we put these things on flies? Number one, we're trying to improve our knowledge of fly behavior in response to these attractants. Uh, we wanted to develop better lures and traps so we can even be better at monitoring and trapping fruit flies than we already are. And we want to understand individual fly responses. Do we have within the fruit fly population a group of super responders and a group of non-responders? Because when you trap flies, you can be wowed by the fact that you've got so many. But how many more are really out there that we didn't catch? So we're trying to understand some of these some of these dynamics. And if you look at some of these insect chemicals that we that we work with, you could get you know just very much ambivalence to anything walking around. Or you can put a very little amount, and these things just go crazy on the on the uh, on the attractant. This is what we're looking for. What we're looking for making it better and making it more streamlined, making sure it lasts longer, and making sure we really can use it to help us control or detect fruit flies. So what's the model? Obviously, putting an RFID tag is, is a crazy idea. But one of our colleagues, Nick Manukas, found somebody in Germany who made these micro RFID tags. And Matthew, do, can you tell us how small they are? Uh, so, I mean, that's a, that fly is maybe this, this long. That's about a, it's about a 2 milligram um, tag on there. So yeah. it's a very, very small tag. But it, but it won't work with Drosophila. It's just too heavy. But on these, these fruit flies, which are bigger, you could just fit them on on the thorax there. And so that's what we, we, we did. And part of the rationale for doing it is because we wanted to see if we could do it. You know, we see nature and everything. We're tracking leopards and radio collars and everything. Can, can we even do anything like this? So we, we wanted to have some fun with it. So what do we do with this? Well, basically, we, we, we go into these field cages that we have on our site. And, and, and we have a, an RFID tag reader, which in order for the reader to read the tag, the insect has to either go over it or just be almost on top of it. Because the, the, the tag is small, but the reader uh, doesn't have the, the power yet to make it more effective. So if any of you software engineers or, or, or electrical engineers have better ways to get more um, RFID tags that can uh, detect from a longer distance, we're all for it. You know, maybe a, a cooperative project with us <laughs> to try and figure out how, how to strengthen that. But what we do is, is we have a, an RFID tag reader. We have a little place where the insect can land, and we pump odors from a, a nearby cage so we're not contaminating it. And it goes up into the cage and right through this hole in the top. And that's the attractant that, that, that the insect responds to. Then we release the flies inside this cage, and we monitor what the fly does. So this is the uh, approximate sensor read area. This is the Teflon tubing that's releasing the odor. And these are the flies that, that actually come to search out these attractants. That's how powerful these attractants are. And every time the fly comes Within that distance, the RFID tag reads it on a computer. And, it, and because the RFID tags are fly specific, we can tell if it comes back in a minute, two minutes, if it stays there for five minutes. And we get a lot of great information on that. So what we're trying to do now is take it from here and see what is that going to tell us? How is that going to improve our ability to uh, control fruit flies or even monitor them? So again, not ready for prime time, but I didn't have anything else to talk to you guys about. <laughs> So thanks to Matthew. So you can tell what percent of the population in the cage Absolutely. comes to the... And, and the those that don't have that, because everyone has a unique code. A lot of them never even respond. So we can say with some certainty that 50% of the flies were released never even responded. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. the ones that responded, 10% are super flies. They never leave. The other ones come back with a certain amount of frequency. Does that help us when we're trapping them and trying to kill them? Well, probably not, except to know that 50% that don't respond. So then, then anything we do to try to control them, we know that's only 50% good. Male, female? 
We can do that too by just tagging males and females. And what do you see? Well, these are male-specific lures. So what we see on these is that primarily the males come. We get a few, fill, a few females come, but mostly it's males. Okay. So that's what we're doing with, with RFID tags. And Matthew has developed a, a, a program, right? He can explain it more than I, but he can, he can do a, a histogram of when they respond, how they respond, the time frame that they respond. And you can get all kinds of nice information using these programs that he, that he has. This is software-related stuff. So if you have questions with that, you can ask Matthew real quickly what program he used and so forth. OK, the last thing I want to do, because time's running short, is, is the, the work we're doing on solar-powered LED lights to help attract coconut rhinoceros bees. Mm -hmm. This insect we do not have yet in Hawaii. And I say yet because it's in Guam, it's been in Palau, and it's almost ready to come here probably along with the tree snake. I was just going to say, they're going to bring the tree snakes. Yeah, <laughs> so when the tree snakes come, come over, these come over. These are great big beetles with a big horn on them. They're beautiful looking animals, but you don't want them in your backyard. And these are the grubs. And these could be a, a, a Chinese delicacy, stir fry, uh -huh. if somebody figures out how to do it right. But these are huge grubs. And in certain countries, they do eat these. It's a very nutritious protein source. So it's not... It's not something you should shake your head at because, you know, those are great protein sources. I've been to countries, uh, Thailand, and some of these countries uh, roast these things, and they, they taste actually pretty good. Other than attacking coconuts, do they do other damage <laughs> to agriculture? Coconut and palms is what you basically. And here's what they do. The, the damage is very, very, uh, very unique in that they, the, the beetle will go into the crown, right into the growing apis, mm -hmm. apis stem of the of the, um, the coconut. And when it does that, you can see it has a very characteristic V-shaped notch. And this notch is that, if you see this in your property, call Hawaii Department of Agriculture right away because we're still worried that, that we're looking at, up at Habi right now to see whether uh, a palm that has something that looks like this is actually coconut rhinoceros bee. So we have no great way to, to control it yet, but we're trying to work with uh, USDA and, and Guam Department of Agriculture to figure out uh, how to how to improve the trapping and, and possibly control it. And we have some ideas. But you know, it can do a lot of damage to your palm if you have a lot of palm trees and coconut trees nearby your property. Uh, again, we employ this uh, gas chromatography electron antennagram detection system. Uh, we have the antennae of the coconut rhin rhinoceros beetle here. It comes out of the tube just like I showed you the last time and gives you these characteristic peaks. What do we do with it? Well, th we're trying to, to, it has a pheromone, which was identified before we got involved. What we're trying to do is find out how do we make a better trap and, and improve it. Well, we've looked at chemicals. We haven't found anything yet, and I want to say yet because there's a lot of uh, chemicals which may uh, end up being uh, synergistic with, with the pheromone that's already been identified for this. And these chemicals are what we call chiromones, which are chemicals which are found from the tree itself. So we're, we're trapping the fronds of the tree. We're trapping that narrow stem where the hole is. Which we Matthew just got back from Guam last week. He covered a whole tree with plastic wrap and trapped the, all the volatiles in the whole tree to try and understand what it is that the insect is orienting to. So we're trying to do some of that. What we found somewhat by serendipitous uh, ways is that light especially UV uh, LED lights, combined with this pheromone, actually does a pretty good job of increasing the attractancy. And you wouldn't, I mean, I, I never thought of that, but Matthew and a few others came up with, with this idea. It seems to have worked very well. This is a picture of the, the trap without light. It's just a big bucket with uh, the, the pheromone right here. The, the, the um, big beetles fly around, they blundering it and fall into the trap. This is the prototype of the light. This is another prototype where you have the, the same vein trap, but it was also a light in there. And we find out that these types of traps actually work better than just the pheromone alone. Okay. The water in the bottom is sticky. No, the, the beetles can't fly straight up. They can't helicopter up. Mm -hmm. So we, we might put a little, let's say, a Vaseline around the corner, but they can't, they can't climb like some other insects, like a, mm -hmm. like a fly can. So once they're in there, it's hard for them to fly out. And of course, this no rhino is the uh, is the eradication program being put on in Guam by the Guam Department of Agriculture, as well as the USDA, who's helping 
them trying to get rid of it. It's, right now, we're thinking it's a losing battle to eradicate it, but if we can control it better and introduce the natural enemies like uh, uh, Fernando has in Plow, maybe we can get a steady state where the, where the damage is not so severe. Okay? Yes? Does it have any natural enemies, other enemies besides you? Uh, well, there, there's a virus that, that is, it's a erythes or a, a virus that only attacks these beetles. No and, birds. birds. That thing is like, is like, is, is like a humvee. A bird, <laughs> if it tried to eat that thing, I don't think you'd have very much left. I mean, it's, it's, it's armored all the way around. You can go like this to it and it doesn't move. You can drop it from here and it just walks away. So it's pretty robust. Right, Matthew? Yeah, Tiang's idea was turkey. Chickens, not, not big enough, but maybe turkeys could eat them. Um, and they are, they are pretty much like a tank. Maybe even on this stage. No, yeah, 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 not the big one. Okay. Uh, nope. But egrets. You get to eat centipedes. We've got some. Yeah, I mean. We have lots of wild turkey in my hole. We'll let you come and play. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, we'll bring the beetles to you once we no, get. No, no. <laughs> 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 the turkeys are our pets. Yeah. <laughs> the hunters will do that. So anyway, this is another kind of tech thing. You know, there, what can we do to improve this? Well, you know, it's it, it's it's about as high tech as, as a non uh, um, uh, uh, non engineer can think of. But maybe, maybe if you have other ideas, you can talk to Matthew and. And some of us about that. These are cheap LED lights that we get from China, and we put them with the battery. And, uh, we have a solar version of that now, and we're trying to see if we can uh, do it in a in a way that people could actually use these. So I think we're we're moving forward on that. Um, we have to go to Guam, which is not my favorite place to go, but we we we're, we're 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 hoping that the more research we do down there, the better we're protected here in case this this animal comes here, and it could be a pest. It's would that by any chance work on a, I think I have a rose beetle that eats my uh, star fruit? Yes. Mm -hmm. we, we, have a, we have a colleague who, who, who has applied this exact technology without the lure, because we don't have a lure for rose beetle. And he has several papers. Uh, and what he's done is developed a, a whole system with, with lights. And because the rose beetle only goes to choose its, its, um, its what to attack in a very narrow window between, for example, Five, just just before dusk to half an hour dusk. After that, you can turn on all lights or turn on off lights. The beetles made the decision. It won't change that. So by by programming these lights just at the right time of the year, you can actually prevent your all, all those rose beetle attacks. Your roses, anything. Those little, little LED lights. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But if you're interested, I'll give you my card. I can put you in contact with our scientists who's doing that work, and it's all published work. And this is kind of another data slide showing the, the, the difference between the UV light and the pheromone versus the pheromone alone, etc. You can just see by the bars there's some differences there. So I didn't want to bore you with, with uh, data when I can show you pictures of stings in California. So, but that's the end of my talk. Uh, obviously, I can't do any of this stuff without uh, both colleagues from around around the uh, Hawaii and, and even around the world, and also funding.